Hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Erez from ZSA, and with me here today is Brandy Agerbeck. Hi, Brandy. Hello. Good to see you again. You too. Yeah, this is our second call. And I'm super excited to be talking to you today. I, I got your book. This is the, whoop, there we go. This is the book yeah. Brandy wrote. It's called The Idea Shapers. And it's all about visual thinking, which as a term sounded vague to me at first, but mm -hmm. when I dug in, I found that I'm super excited about it. And <laughs> I found out it's something I need in my life. Awesome. Uh, being so text-based, you know, I think me and, and, and many of the people are watching or listening to this probably are also quite text heavy, you know, writers, coders and such. So yeah. maybe can you share a little bit about what is visual thinking and where does it, where does it come into play for a person who's very text-based? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, there's ways that we're, we're just sort of built as visual thinkers. And so much of how we learn and most of our workplaces have forced us into that text-based because that because text is get lets you get really specific. <laughs> it's really easy to distribute. So there's so many ways that we're naturally, you know, three-dimensional people in three-dimensional space, you know, relating to the world around us. And we've turned ourselves into text-based folks and very linear, often very linear thinkers because of the modes we're working in. Um, so visual thinking is just kind of going back to using your senses more, um, uh, letting yourself kind of have that space to picture your ideas. I think there are some folks who do that more naturally than others, um, but also just to kind of relate things more spatially. One of my favorite things to say is, when is the last time you solved a problem in a straight line? So, you know, when we try to solve with text or, you know, a, a sequence, um, and I'm looking forward to talking more about, you know, that imp the importance of that in coding specifically. But um, uh, certainly as you're kind of working out what you're trying to get something to do that's complex, things don't line up in a, in a line. Right. Uh, even writing that book was challenging because I had to, had to make it fit on pages that were in a particular sequence. So what's so fantastic about visual thinking is it lets you take your thinking in a lot of different directions. Uh, one thing is if you're putting an idea down on a piece of paper, uh, you can put it anywhere on that piece of paper. Uh, and then the next idea you get, you have to think about how does that next idea relate to what's already on the page. So um, it can be proximity, but it could also be things like this idea is kind of overarching this other set of ideas, or these ideas overlap, or this idea fits into this idea this way. So you can tell even with gestures, <laughs> you know, that's the... That's the kind of thinking that 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 um, uh, that I think can help us handle complexity more. I was going to say it was natural, but then I had to had to you know admit that that's probably extremely natural for me, which is why I'm teaching these very specific techniques so that more of us can handle that complexity um, instead of trying to make really complex things either fit into you know a tiny oversimplified thing, which doesn't really work, or to try to make a, a very very complex thing turn out into a straight line. Right, right, right. And that's something that really struck me about the book and about the way you teach complexity, right? Yeah. So it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost like a bad word, you know? I mean, when you look at it outside, like it's keep it simple, stupid, right? And, um, <laughs> and there is this ongoing push to simplify, simplify, simplify. And even one of the things, um, that kind of struck me. My background is in writing, and one of the classics mm -hmm. in the field is on writing well, which mm -hmm. which I like. It's it's a great book, but you know there's this um, tendency to say, well, if you can use a small word instead of a big one, use a small word, keep it simple, which mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. I, I agree mm -hmm. with that, and I do think writing should communicate. But where I found myself making the mistake of thinking, well, the idea should be simple, and ideas often are not. Yeah. And it really, it was very interesting for me to see and to experience for myself how thinking visually, now I, I'm a rookie, I'm, I'm very new at this, but I already had a little bit of, you know, playing around with it and, and sketching out ideas. Yeah. How it allowed me to embrace complexity. It makes complexity, like I realized that for me, complexity mm -hmm. felt painful 
because I was using the wrong medium. Oh, it's basically wow. when you, when I try to linearize complexity to to get it down on on as text, right? And wield it, it's like, uh, but then when I kind of spray it out on a big piece of paper, yep. Suddenly, it's not as painful. It, it's kind of engaging. It's kind of fun. Yeah, and that's. Can I interrupt for a, a moment? If I was interrupting your train of thought, I don't know. Um, and that's that's absolutely why that word shaping and shapers. You know, the book is called the idea shapers is like it's that is just the word because it's it's about um you know you're you're wrangling or wrestling something i have i talk about uh, five types of visual thinkers there may be more but these this sort of is a model i use to um help folks identify as a visual thinker and uh one of them is the mess wranglers and complexity tacklers so when you talked about you know keep it simple stupid you know i shudder i i literally shudder when i hear that phrase because you know, the folks who love wrangling complexity, it's like, that's the beauty of it. You know, they want to figure out that we're motivated by figuring out how all the pieces fit together. Um, and I think, you know, like you said, that there's, the pain isn't, the pain isn't necessarily, and well, I think there's some pain in complexity when you don't know what all the pieces are and you don't know how they fit together, because there's just that tension of figuring something out. But I do think there is a lot of pain created in trying to force something into the wrong shape you know, trying to force something into a linear shape when it turns out it, you know, it's this, you know, this piece fits into here and this thing goes over here um, that, you know, that's, that's where a lot of pain is. I also think there's pain in here is this big, beautiful, compl complicated, more complex thing. And you're trying to lop pieces off of it to make it simple. So those are all ways that, you know, there's a sense of, um, I'm a huge fan of the blank page because you let the shape emerge, even if it feels tense and weird at first and uncomfortable because you haven't figured it out yet that if you just give that space to go through that process and push things around and, and sketch things out uh you know in all the sorts of different ways whether it's post-it notes or a giant piece of paper whatever the the physical tools may be um but that that what's so fantastic is when you let yourself be in that uncomfortable amorphous space when the when the shape of it emerges it's so much stronger and then you're like well, of course, that's the shape this thing needed to be. <laughs> right, so, right, yeah. right, right. That kind of speaks to iteration, which is something I wanted to get to. Yeah. Um, but, but just touching on the sense of discomfort first, I think one thing that, um, that I felt when you're new when, since I'm new at this, right? There is the discomfort of the shape of the idea, but there's also a sense of discomfort in the tools mm -hmm. that I use, like, or lack of confidence in my graphic ability, right? I'm yeah, exactly, I can't sketch to save my life, right? right? And I'm totally not a visual artistic person, right? I've always been a word person, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of my background. Yep. And so, um, one thing I've tried to overcome this, of course, is I reached for my favorite crutch, which is digital. Mm. I have an iPad with with a with a, an Apple pencil, and yeah. I I took like Concept, which is a nice drawing app with an endless canvas, mm -hmm. and I drew out an idea. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it was a more comfortable experience because it was more familiar. I had an undo mm -hmm. button. I could, I, ma I made an error and then I copy pasted my error. I didn't have to sketch it out again. There was yeah. a familiar comfort. Yeah. But then when I compared it to a more physical experience, we have, we have kids, right? So we have mm -hmm. big drawing papers, like giant yeah. sheets. Yep. Uh, we get them at home hardware or something for, you know, it's the stuff they use for packing. Yeah. For and sure. Pardon? No, I just said, yeah, for sure. I can picture. Yeah. I know exactly. You know, you know the ones. Yeah. It. Yeah. So then for, for the same idea I had, actually, I grabbed one of those sheets of papers and I grabbed the kids markers mm -hmm. and I drew it out on paper and it was a totally different experience. It was not as comfortable um, mm -hmm. in the sense that I had no undo button and I had to kind of yeah. squiggle over things, but there was almost when I was done with my idea and I had this big sheet of paper depicting what I was trying to work out, there was an almost palpable sense of relief, like a, mm. it's out there, you know? 
which I didn't get with an iPad. What do you oh, think about that? I love that story. <laughs> I'm going to be quoting your story if you don't mind. Um, I think it, I think what what's happening is that, and I you know I'm agnostic about tools. If a if a tablet works for somebody, great. And I do think you know what you just shared is one of the magical parts of visual thinking with physical materials. You know that idea of that we're physical humans in three dimensional space. And when we're literally like touching things and you know, you, you have this giant sheet of paper, you're relating to those ideas in a different way because literally it's, you know, outsizing you and you gave yourself that space to work in, you know, and if you work, you know, uh, conversely, you're trying to distill ideas on like post-it notes or index cards, you're going to have a different way you relate to that with your physical body. And I think that when screens, you know, digital tools and screens can, do phenomenal things and they're still an abstraction and distancing you know it's not the physical world right. you may have that physical object but it's 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 not there's a there's, there's that distancing so the fact that you know I, I believe that when you kind of flatten out that that abstraction and that distance and you're physically grabbing that those uh, art supplies from your kids and you're doing this that you're far more tuned into the phys physical cues in your body and it's something that, um, you know, when I wrote the idea shapers, I, I did mention physical cues, like to notice that, because that's actually really useful information. That also, the next step is, that's, that is all about tapping into your intuition. So the fact that I wrote over 400, you know, pages in this book and never explicitly mentioned intuition, it was because it was the nose on my face, because it was the way I was so, you know, tuned into, because this is, for me, the way I, I naturally work, you know, there's that experience. It's not uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable for other reasons, but it's not uncomfortable because it's new just because again, you know, it's practice. Right. Um, but I think that's super valuable information that when folks want to leap to digital, because, you know, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, it's what they have. It's what they know. It feels fancier. It feels more important. It feels more modern, whatever. It's really, really heavily marketed too, right? Like oh, for sure. I, I kind of had this sense that as soon as I unbox my new iPad, I will be a more creative human being, you know? Right. Of course, <laughs> totally. it's really marketed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, strong messages there. Absolutely. Um, and I, yeah, so I think that, I think that just that directness of those materials, and I love that you use that kind of newsprint packing material because it's not precious, you know, because we, we, we are so good at making, you know, the, the sketchbook that is, uh, you get the new sketchbook and then it's too perfect to use or the journal or whatever it is, yeah. right? You know, the fact that you had something that, you know, literally is usually crumpled up, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're, the stakes were low. So you could just use the material for what it was instead of worrying about messing it up so much. That's true. I think for me, it also helped that what I usually see on that particular medium in our household is yeah. is pretty basic uh, yeah. art. Like I can live up to that standard, you know. I can I can yeah. make something as nice as a three year old. I hope, yeah. you know. <laughs> awesome. Um, yep. Yeah, and so <clears throat> one of the things though that I got with the actually I want to backtrack here before we delve into the how because I was going to touch on the how of the drawing, but I want to I want to touch a little bit more on the why. Because in the book, you give some pretty specific scenarios when you are reaching, uh, when's a good time to reach for visual thinking in your life, in your day to day. And my, my story without sheet of paper and the iPad, I woke up at 5.30 a.m. Uh, one morning, which is early for me, even it was mm -hmm. even before the kids. And, uh, and I had a bunch of thoughts going on in my head, like, and I was trying to process something that happened the previous day. And did I make the right decision there? And why don't I feel so good about that and all that? And usually I would maybe journal through it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I went, no, I'm going to, I'm going to visually sketch it out as a system. I'm going to awesome. sketch out what happened there. What was the, I think the causality and how, like, what are the links between the various elements of what had happened to me? And that's what I did. And that really helped. So that's yeah. one case where visual thinking really came through for me um, because it, I know, like, the result for me was two things. There was a sense of relief and understanding of what had happened, but it was also for the future. I ended up with a resolution, with a decision, with a new way, like, oh, next time I'm going to do so-and-so. Yeah. And here's why, right? Yeah. Um, 
So that's one case that works for me. What are other cases you feel or other circumstances where visual thinking is the tool to reach for day to day? I think that um, one of the most common, wait one second, a little froggy this morning. Um, I think one of the, the biggest, broadest, most human, most common things is feeling overwhelmed. And there is just that very simple act of getting that, that what is buzzing up here out onto that piece of paper, that post-it note or that index card or whatever it is. And it could be a tablet too, that's okay. Um, but just that, that getting it outside of yourself is I think un, undeniably my number one use of it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Thankfully, I'm not somebody ever lacking in ideas. Um, so I think that is just a general case. But I think that, you know, your, I love that you said that in that particular um, uh, experience, you were, you would, you know, you were able to look at causality and make a decision. And I think that there's, um, you know, th that you can really do problem solving in ways because you're able to push things around. Um, and I think that, um, Oh, I lost it. I lost it for a second. That's okay. We'll pick up something else. Um, that there's there's so many things you can do. I one of the things is I think it's really great as a communication tool. You know, just to get your ideas down if you have something to say, and because all those things are buzzing in your head, and you know, you've been on the 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 audience side of a of a bad communicator where they're just you know working through their stuff and it's coming out of their mouth, right? But if you if you actually used pen and paper to kind of get those ideas out and figure out what is the shape of what you're trying to say. Now, you may then also choose to uh, visually represent what you want to say. Uh, you know, it could be like, here's a model, like you, you've worked out something and you say, I think, it, I think it's shaped like this. This is the model I want to convey. And then you walk people through that visual model. Right. Um, or not, or it's just made you a better communicator because you figured out how the pieces fit together. So, you know, I my life's work is to help people, you know, identify as visual thinkers and to think visually. And, you know, as far as like, you know, you're talking about the marketing of the iPad, a marketing problem I have is it can be used for so many freaking things. <laughs> you know? so right. it's like, right. but you don't want to, you know, if I say it, it, you know, it works for everything. It, that it sounds like it doesn't work for anything, you know, that yeah. kind of, you know, people want that specificity, but in the book, it's a, it's a series of, what I, one of my favorite things to do, I love that complexity and I uh, love breaking down something that is complex into learnable pieces. So the structure of the book, the, the, the whole middle section is a series of 24 different idea shapers. And each one of those, I sort of just open up with, here's the concept. Then I talk about some of the kind of nuance and details and choices you have. And then each one of those ends with that idea shaper at work. So the landscape at work, for example. And that was to really make it more concrete, to make it more actionable. Um, because, you know, I love the abstraction, but I had to recognize that people are going to want to see, okay, well, so what do I do with this? Um, and, you know, to the point of how people want, and we were talking about this when we talked last time, was um, that people want things to be really tidy. So, you know, as I shared the idea of the book, you know, people were like, well, that's too many things. <laughs> or why are there only, you know, why are there six idea shapers in this step and there's four ideas in this in this step? And it's like, because that's what it is. Right. <laughs> it's just like it's the actual like shape of the thing, like that. Exactly. Exactly. And as long as you break it down into learnable pieces and the structure makes sense, it's learnable. You know, do I think somebody's gonna read that book, you know, page one to four hundred whatever and instantly understand all of it? Absolutely not, especially because it truly is, it's truly understood when you experience it, when you practice it, like the, the stories you've or, you're already sharing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the uh, being comfortable with that complexity that, you know, that's, that's my happy place personally. So. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's interesting. We, we interview users, we interview uh, people who use our keyboards who are often yep. developers. And one of the people we interviewed recently, she had mentioned there's photos of her workspace and you can see a, a notebook, a, a pad, physical yeah. paper next yep. to her computer. And she said in her interview that that really struck me. That was before I actually met you. She said a few minutes of sketching can save me hours of coding. And yeah. uh, that was really interesting to, to read. So yeah, totally. Another 
another story I guess I can share from my brief experience with it was um, I came to hang out with my kids and I sat down on the floor and grabbed a sheet of paper and started sketching out my day just because yeah. I'm practicing visual thinking now. So I wanted to express my day as a sketch without yep. too many words. And my kid who's six grabbed a sheet of paper, sat next to me and just did the same thing. And, you know, which, which makes sense. Kids often emulate, right? But what struck me there is how clearly and instantly the format communicated mm. when communicating with a kid right because when you try to express kind of a grown-up thought to a kid you often have to pick and choose your words carefully or they don't want to listen to the end especially if it's something they don't really want to hear right now right <laughs> but but sketches and pictures are so compelling like you want to yeah. look at the thing and you want to make it your own and because i'm such a such not a visual artist he can very easily live up to my standard of drawing right so we're we're kind of equal on that medium it's not like i because in the past i tried to take a, a sheet he's a good reader right but he's still working mm -hmm. on his writing so i try to take a sheet of paper and and make notes and you know kind of summarize a discussion we had maybe in words yep and that would very quickly devolve into a place of inequality because my handwriting is still a little bit better than his sure and my sketching frankly is not Mm -hmm. right and yep. we we are both on level ground there and and i found that that physical expression of our ideas makes us more equal it makes it makes the communication uh, more compelling but also more on even footing which helps i think him feel yeah. better about whatever ideas he has yeah i think there's a couple things going on there one is this is a way i'm not saying every single child is really into drawing but i think most of them are until they're told they're doing it wrong. You know, that's what I see on the other side of that is somebody who has drawn nonstop and 46 now. So, you know, since age, whatever, one or two or whatever. Um, so, so that's a, it is a truly natural way we express ourselves. And, you know, I, I'm not a parent, but, you know, I hear stories from other parents where their child draws something and then they look at it and they're like, what on earth is that? Right. All you need to do is ask the ask your son or daughter. So what what's going on here? And then this whole story unfolds, and you know you can tell the wheels are turning, and they're making meaning for themselves. Like they are in it to win it. And of course, it looks the way it looks, given that it's for them. You know, it's not necessarily for an audience, aside from the fact that it looks like that because they're six, and that is where their you know their development and their fine motor skills and their drawing experience is. So there's that, you know, that whole kind of, this is what we naturally do. And that leads into this idea that, you know, I appreciate what you're saying about the parody or feeling comfortable or being able to quiet that inner critic. Cause you're like, Hey, I'm using the same materials. My, my kids use, you know, we can sit side by side. And so often, you know, people, one of the most, you know, of course, almost unfortunately more often than not somebody will tell me they can't draw or they say I draw like a seven-year-old and they draw like a seven-year-old because they stopped drawing when they were seven you know I draw like a 46 year old with this level of skill because it true you know the the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours right yeah. so and and for me on my side of things it breaks my heart that that inner critic is stopping someone from picking up you know, from their seven-year-old <laughs> level of experience and just getting that stuff out. Because, you know, I'm sure what you've practiced with, you know, you may be thinking like, well, it's kind of messy or whatever, but it's still been useful. I think every story you've told me, you really got results from it or yeah. progress at least, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's, so, so I, I call that the drawing switch where it's like, you know, at some point, most people have turned off that drawing switch. Because unfortunately, culturally the only acceptable ways to draw i don't believe this but this is the prevailing notion is unless you're going to be a capital a artist or an architect or a fashion designer or whatever and you know there's there's very clear um expectations about what those particular drawings look like so those that switch shuts off for nearly everybody <laughs> and not you know and they they unfortunately have turned off that switch to all these other reasons you could draw that have nothing with a specific role or representational drawing at all. You know, I'm, I'm, that's why I love teaching 
visual thinking because it is about abstraction because it is it's the thinking part <laughs> you know it's the you know like you said you were able to see causality because you're getting this stuff out you were able to see what the shape of your day was you know you were able to make a decision all these things it's not about building a house or creating a masterpiece but it still was you know extremely useful in those in those cases so far yeah yeah and it's actually a fascinating i don't say paradox but it's it's you mentioned in the book, you say you can either be product focused or process focused with with your drawing. Yep. And it's very, there is an irony, there is a, it's an expected irony, but like if you are process focused, if you're focused on, on the experience, drawing as a verb, you call it, yep. naturally the noun you produce will improve over time because you won't stop and that improvement will just happen naturally. Yep. And this reminds me of a conversation I recently had with my business partner. He is, uh, he's a tremendous um, s sketch artist, almost, I would say, you know, it's, it, he's an engineer, but, yeah. you know, like a decade ago, um, we were working on a project together and he sketched something out and uh, I took the papers and I kept them. I saved them for years later because what he produced was so visually beautiful it was just something yeah. quick with like a, a pen on paper and then recently when i got into visual thinking i asked him so how how did you get so good like how did you ever go to school were you ever like educated in visual arts he said no i just never stopped he said he said that as a, as a five-year-old he yeah. started drawing cars and stuff through the yeah. you know going through the street and imagining what the engine looks like on the inside and all that and just kept on doing that yeah until today at, at, you know, at his age, uh, yeah. tremendous ability. And, and that got me thinking, it loops back to, of course, parenting as many things for me do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so my kid draws something and shows me the drawing. How do I react? Mm -hmm. And often there is this instinct to say, Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, that's great. But really, um, that's again, product focus. And even if I'm complimenting, it's, I imagine like the, the, the thinking in, in his head is like, hmm, the next one better be as good, you know? And that mm -hmm. kind of activates. Whereas when he shows me the painting, I can say, oh, I see a line here. I see this is very red. I see a circle. Just describe yeah. what I see, which is also about the thing, but it, it doesn't, you know, ascribe any qualitative feedback there. It's just, okay, you made a circle. Or I can even ask, oh, what does a circle stand for? If yeah. it stands for something and kind of, describe what I see rather than compliment or even try to correct as some parents do, right? Just, oh no, that's not how you draw a car. Yes, it is, right? Or like, I see a circle, I see a line. And then he yeah. explains what it is and goes into the process. I love, I love, love, love that story. I've loved every story. <laughs> it's awesome. And what I especially love about your discovering sort of this, I see a line, I see red, I see a circle, is that your, and this is exactly what I do when I'm, what, it depends on the kind of workshop or, you know, thing I'm doing, but um, I have this three-day workshop called The Lab where it's extremely emergent and people really are vulnerable. They make these giant drawings and some folks are brand new to visual thinking. Some folks have some experience. Some folks are in ruts. We just kind of take, I take folks exactly where they're at. Right. And once it happens to be a group of six people who join me. So once six people have made their drawings, the first thing I ask is, so how did that feel? So I want them to notice, pick up on those cues and just kind of have, you know, I want them to reflect on their own experience. Then I ask them to say, what did you notice about the speaker or whatever the content was that we we're drawing? It might be audio, it might be video in that particular case. You know, so again, noticing what are they, you know, what, what is their experience in re relationship to what they were drawing. And then when, when I open it up to people responding to each other's work, I say, so what do you notice? And, and I say, you know, I, so I'm trying to model that pattern of, you know, so what do you notice in other people's work? And it can be, I'm really attracted to that thing because we do love beauty. <laughs> Aesthetics right. are important. And you can also say, this thing is confusing me over here. You know, like, I, I don't know how to make meaning of this. So can you tell me about that? But the, the issue is, so all I need to do that so explicitly because what people naturally do is they jump like, you know, three, four steps ahead and they've made judgments and they've made assumptions. 
and they've lost that opportunity to have a conversation around what what how did you get here how did it feel and also when when if you're looking at my work and i get to hear your observations and what's confusing you or what is resonating with you i learn so much freaking more <laughs> about your experience with my work like I, I did a tedx talk in 2013 and towards the end of it i had two flip charts side by side and it was demonstrating that idea of um and i do a lot of facilitation work and we'll give breakout groups flip charts and i'll have to come back and present something and um very often what happens is a group comes back with a very you know they found the person with the best handwriting and they made a list you know and they they, they come back with something that looks really pretty but there really isn't any work there right, right? there they haven't really processed anything and, and as i say in the talk and demonstrate in the talk Another group could come back with something that's messy as heck, but you can tell they actually made a ton of progress because they were pushing things around and crossing things out and just going, okay, how do we wrangle this? And, you know, and the issue is that it's culturally, it is very, very product focused. So somebody would be like, oh, you have such pretty handwriting. <laughs> it's like, okay. And that, that doesn't support the process. It probably actually went against the process if that group was worried about making a tidy list and they never really dove deep into what they were there to do. So Again, the complexity, yeah. the inherent mess of complexity, right? Yeah. Like, so yep. true. Yep. And that kind of brings me to the idea of iteration that you mm -hmm. touch on a few times. And iterating uh coders call it refactoring when you have mm -hmm. uh, you know whether as a writer you you go back to your draft and iterate as a coder you go back to your code and you refactor it yeah fundamental concept when working with ideas yeah what struck me and i kind of wanted to, to to hear your thoughts on is the way i'm used to iterate again text-based is i go to my draft or to my code and usually you know it's versioned in git or whatever so i know i'm not going to lose the, the previous version Yep. And then I take the artifact I've created and begin molding it, kind of like mm -hmm. going back to, say, um, a sculpture the next day. And I take off the wraps and I work yep. on the same thing. Whereas in the book, the way you kind of explain iteration or the way I understood it, maybe I'm wrong, is you you iterate by essentially creating a new artifact like you. You have your old drawing. And it's right there. You keep it. You don't have to crumple or throw it. It's right there. Mm -hmm. But you essentially use it as a reference and take a new blank sheet of paper or a new stack of index cards. Uh, maybe not the index cards. We'll touch on that. But if I'm making what you call a landscape, like a one mm -hmm. big sheet that shows all the ideas, take a new sheet yep. and make a new version from scratch. Is that, did, did I get that right? Yes, I, I think there's, a, you know, it can be that. It can. It could be that you're erasing things. It happens that personally I, um, I do almost everything in ink. So, and I'm totally fine with crossing stuff out or, you know, making something, you know, uh, going over something so you notice it, <laughs> you know, if it's really messy. So it just happens because I love, you know, my flare pens, which somehow I took all my flare pens away. So I don't have one. Oh my goodness. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I think part of that probably just comes from the materials I tend to use. But I think that my, in my experience and experience working with other people, <clears throat> there is that um, uh, that tension, that physical tension, and you're getting stuff out, and then there's sort of like a oh, oh wait wait okay, and things start to come together, and it's like you know I that dr that drawing that I've pushed aside got me to this point, so let me grab the new piece of paper, so I can just make another you know it, it's the next iteration, and I want to really emphasize that I think. There's so many of us who know how important iteration is, but again, culturally, and I think it's almost entirely global that we are rewarded for showing the finished masterpiece. And only our colleagues understand in whatever kind of work we're doing, only our colleagues understand the process it took to get there. You know, we, so it's, I think, I think there's a, you know, a beautiful side effect to when folks use visual thinking is they're giving themselves much more space in that process zone. And, you know, that, that we can have conversations about the process. You know, there's a whole other conversation to be had about when you make one of those weird, messy drawings, how do you share it with somebody else to have a conversation? 
you know, that has a lot of issues around vulnerability and critique and blah, 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 blah. But I think anytime we can open up that space to, to, you know, enjoy the process, be purposeful in the process, and be iterative in that it's not, nothing's going to come fully formed. Right. Like it, I, hap I happen to grow up with a father who was a brilliant artist and a total jerk. <laughs> and so many of the hardest points of my, the hardest lessons growing up was when he expected to be, no expected me to know something I hadn't learned, you know, and it was all those kind of expectations of, well, this is going to be, you know, he was, I like to, um, the context is my dad was an alcoholic quality assurance inspector for the Department of Defense. Wow. <laughs> so okay. we're talking extremely high standards on everything. Um, and there's definitely positive things I've taken from that. But the point is that you have to learn this thing. You have to get the practice in this thing. You know, so I think that's why, you know, it's a, it's a message I like to, you know, share wherever I can because recognizing that it's not going to come out fully formed that's just reality, you know? So give yourself that grace of it's going to feel weird and it's, and, and it feeling weird as part of the process. And then it's going to feel a little more comfortable. And then you're going to have that shift and you go, Oh my gosh, this is so great. You know, and you, you know, you keep on working until you get a much stronger product. I'm guessing, you know, you've seen or know, or personally experienced when you try to rush something and you didn't give it the time to iterate you know, you didn't give it the process to iterate and you're like, well, it's done, but it could have been so much stronger had it not tried to, you know, not, if it was given the space to, to be processed. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. No, it, it totally <laughs> does because, because okay. to, to like, it's, it's a back and forth creating something, whether it's a blog post or a piece of code or, or a sketch, like you uh, output and then you have to look at the thing. And that's where iteration starts. You have to sit down and like, hmm, what did, what did I just do here? And look at it. And then of course you wanna start fixing things. And often when we rush things, we don't even look at them after having spewed them out and like, okay, it's out, let's. Yeah. And you don't really even know what you've made there because it's, it's already out, it's gone, it's fast. I don't even wanna look at it because I don't have time to <laughs> work at it again. Yeah. And I guess, one more thought on iteration I, I, I yep. wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on is iterating between formats. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm very proficient with a keyboard. I'm proficient with words often. And this goes back to, um, to expressing our ideas. Often when I have a lot going on inside, the most natural thing for me to do and the quickest thing for me to get that out from my head uh, or from my heart, wherever is yeah. uh, to get it, to grab a keyboard, grab sublime text, and just write a bunch of stuff out. Yep. Now, would you say that at this point, if I wanted to keep processing what I just spewed, often like my, my usual uh, thing is I go and I read it and I start tweaking it and, and editing until it rings true. Mm -hmm. Would you say instead of this, do I stand to benefit from, okay, I output the, the big thing on, on, on the screen and yep. then turn my back to the screen, grab a big sheet of paper and try to basically do the same thing or iterate on it using visual thinking instead of processing the draft. You know what I mean? Would that, right. do you think that's beneficial? I, it can be. I, I think the, the thing is, you know, from what you just described, one of the biggest things is speed. You know, when you're, we think just the speed of thought is so gorgeously fast. And so I would say that, you know, if, if, if that is your fastest way of getting the stuff out, fantastic. Right. So, so, um, and I appreciate that what you're just asking is doing that first. And then if you do visual thinking, um, the biggest thing is what I think is great about switching modalities is it shakes up the kind of patterns or the ruts we might be in. Mm -hmm. It just, it just forces us to process in a different way. So there isn't anything inherently wrong about you kind of getting all that text out and then continuing to work in that format. But if you then grab that sheet of paper, you're going to relate to the information in a different way because it's going to be spatial because now you're like, all right, I'm not going to just recopy what I, you know, I'm not going to fill this giant sheet of paper. I don't recommend filling the giant sheet of paper with writing. 
you know, with, with that big piece of paper or small piece of paper or whatever, you know, you have that opportunity to think, okay, how do these pieces fit together? Um, so I think that just shifting modality, it's going to give you new information. And I think that's just going to make what you're working on stronger. Um, and that doesn't mean that, or more, like it's testing it, it's making it more thorough. You know, I'm not saying you can't stay in text mode and, and not create something strong. I think you absolutely can, especially with experience. And I think there's just something really, really uh, lovely giving yourself the opportunity to process in a different way to shake up those patterns. Like the, I grab my sketchbook over here because like, and you know, I talk about how this is the way we relate to the world in portrait format right, for the most right. part. And just doing that, what that does to shift somebody's thinking is fantastic. And I know, you know, th like this happens to be a notebook that's specifically designed this way, a sketchbook with the shorter side bound to encourage that. Um, and still I see folks, and this isn't a criticism, it's, it's of course they're going to do this because this is the, their previous experience and their training, who will still just treat this like they'll go from, you know, make a column of, of ideas, a column of ideas, a column of ideas, um, you know, which is because, again, they're just trying to adapt like this step from what they already know. But the fact that you can put your ideas anywhere on that piece of paper, you're going to come up with different things. Like that's just the beauty of, of shifting modalities. Right. That really connects to something we touched on on our previous conversation. I'm, I, I love nonfiction. I read a lot of nonfiction. And usually yep. after I read, I go and I, I write. I, I kind of spend some time processing what I read. And, um, and recently I, I read this book called Frugal Hedonism. Great book, by the way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really good look at, uh, at m more minimal living, but not from the viewpoint of like, let's scrimp and save, but it can be fun. Anyways, I read this book and then I wanted to summarize what I wrote. Yeah. And usually I do that by text and I decided, no, I'm actually going to do it visually now. Mm -hmm. That was hard. And it felt like the right kind of hard because usually, you know, we, many of us are very practiced as taking a page of text and distilling it down to a paragraph or a couple of lines. Easy. Yep. There is not much inner processing happening there yep. but i found that if i try to take a page of text someone else's text or or a concept in the book you have this beautiful picture of like uh you show uh you show a page of text and then you show like you highlight a little paragraph and you take it out onto a sheet of paper oh yeah, yeah. and then so i tried to do that and it was way harder mm -hmm. but having done that i felt like i had a much better grasp of the idea i felt like it was mine to an extent because I, I really created something that wasn't yes. using, say, synonyms or my my version of the text. It, it, it was a picture. That thing was not a picture first, and now it is a picture that I made. And yeah. it somehow made it more mine? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and that kind of leads to another thought I had or a struggle I had in the digital versus physical. So being primarily digital and, of course, obsessed with archiving, backing up, mm -hmm. retrieving, searching, all those things, right? It's, it's yeah. like, it's my idea. So of course I want to make sure that it's backed up like four different ways and it's searchable so that in four years I can find what I thought, you know, yep. I think many people are like that. I know, you know, and, and, and when I thought about it a little bit deeper, I found, well, I never really do go back to these things almost never. <laughs> yeah. um, but still one thing, one fear I face, like the, the, the fears I face when I grab a sheet of paper. One is, okay, my incompetence with a medium, which I'm kind of working through. But the other big challenge is, what if I'm going to have like this brilliant output, brilliant idea, brilliant experience here, and I can never find it again. You know, I'm just going to mm -hmm. um, file this away somewhere and never be able to hit control F and find yeah. what that thing was. <laughs> how, how do yeah. people deal with it? How do you deal with that? Um, so uh, one, I want to interject and then come back to this, this particular scenario. Um, we've been saying the word visual thinking, and I think through our story. So when you say the word visual, I think a lot of people are going to default to thinking of pictures and icons. And so many of the stories we've talked about has actually been about making your thinking physical and spatial. Right. And I just, because we haven't had any visuals and we haven't talked about any visuals and it's funny because I was looking around and 
I don't want to, you know, I don't know if you have anything within arm's reach that, that has been one of these new experiences. And I think I happen to have like a, yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh, and look, I've got a nearly empty. <laughs> oh, here we go. So this is, I'm not sure how well this is going to show up there, but this is me trying to figure out how do my different online courses relate to my five types of visual thinkers. Like that's messy. You know, no like, icons that's... either. Yeah, no icons exactly. or anything. Exactly. Circles and words. Exactly. Like this over here is kind of supposed to be a human figure. It's like a lump of a body in a circle for a head. Hmm. <laughs> but this is the point is that, that there's so much of this we do that has nothing to do with representational imagery, which is the stuff that freaks people out, right? So I just wanted to make sure I, I because I think so many people, that's when you say visual, that's where they go to. And I wrote this um, back in 2011, I wrote something called the Brand of Festo, because I was just trying to like, get something out there about why do I care about this? And, and I said, you know, this is this visual thinking, even though most folks have never really heard of it, it's still the most popular name for this kind of thing. But I would really love to call it, you know, visual spatial kinesthetic. <laughs> That's really long. Um, but I just wanted to, to surface that particular idea. And now did I remember what you actually asked to answer it? Um, I just, oh, our archiving. I just want to say it was really great to see to see that page. I feel better about my visual thinking now. I'm like, okay, yeah, I think maybe no, I'm being right. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's no, awesome. I'm, yeah, and and I think you know if you look at the at the book specifically, you know, um, I very I, yes, of course, there's going to be more. There's going to be representational images in here because I'm demonstrating ideas, but basically. It's, you know, all those idea shapers, the 24 idea shapers are all lines and shapes and color and proximity. And this much of the book at the end is specifically about pictorial imagery on right. purpose. Because look at all, like, you could have a lifetime of amazing thinking and productivity and decision making and prioritization and communication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> with, with all this, all these things that are diagrammatic. That aren't Especially when I'm sketching for myself. Yes. Uh, I, I think like if I know this square is supposed to be a house or whatever, yes. right? Like that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the idea of archiving. Um, and retrieving. And retrieving, right. So I, you know, for me, it, I similarly, I can make a drawing and unless I'm drawing content, somebody like if I was learning something. So if I was at a conference and I was making visual notes for myself, um, those are cases where I may go back and go, okay, what was the structure of what they said? Or what was this detail? And I want to retrieve something. In my experience, the, the ones where I'm thinking, of, I'm working out my own stuff, I don't go back because it, it, was, it was about the process. It got me, as you mentioned, drawing as a verb. When you're doing process-focused drawing, the only judgment of that drawing, it's not about judging it as a, as a finished product, as a masterpiece, right? It's not pretty or ugly or right or wrong, beautiful or, you know, said the same thing twice. Um, it's about the only judgment of those processed focused drawings are, did it get you a step farther in your process? So for me, I can make that drawing and it got me a step farther in my process. And I probably iterated it on a different sheet of paper or, you know, like I like to sketch things out. Like there still isn't a stylist that res is responsive and new as nuanced as what, you know, this can do. So so often what I'll do is I'll physically draw something, scan it in, and then you know, colorize it or whatever digitally, because I may want, stylistically I might want a finished product that looks like whatever. It's something right? to share, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's a drawing to communicate, and that has a different function than these kind of drawings like you just saw, that's just to think through your own ideas. This is circuitous, but basically I think that uh, when you're, a lot of times those drawings, they're just, they're just part of the process. They're one step in the process. There is an artifact left over. So, you know, very earlier you said, you know, you're either drawing as a product or drawing as a process. And that's not, you know, there's, they're always, you know, they're always combined, but I definitely want us to give ourselves the space to focus on process because we don't do that naturally. We weren't trained to do that you know, your six-year-old is doing that. <laughs> and please, 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 you know, encourage him because as your business partner, you know, you can see from your business partner's experience, staying in that space is so rewarding. There's so many different gifts. Um, I think as far as like archiving or retrieving, I think that um, <laughs> I don't do this personally, but something as simple as if you use sketchbooks, like this is my sketchbook right now, 
you can create like bullet journaling. Folks who do bullet journaling, they, they have an index. They, they make an index and say, okay, this page is this thing. You could do that with, with things that aren't on a grid with text and check boxes. Um, so that's an option. Another option is just snap a pic picture with your phone and have, you know, name it something that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, I, you know, I know there is technology that, that is learning how to do search drawings, but I think a lot of times if, if it's about naming something well and put in, putting it in the right place digitally, that's probably going to get you back to it if you need to get back to it. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, like you yeah. were saying, I don't often need to go back to those, to those drawings because again, it was about getting something out and responding to it, you know, and getting that clarity and then you know, onto the next thing. Yeah, you know, when, when you were talking, I suddenly went like this because I had such a light bulb moment there because I realized that those two threads of iteration and archiving really connect for me because let's say maybe I start with text, I go blah, get all the text yep. out and then I turn my back to it and sit down on the floor here or whatever on the wall and sketch out. Yeah. And then I iterate back into text and distill the insights I got from those two phases into text, which is to an extent my natural medium, Yeah. then first of all, that end result could really, could be an, an a findable, retrievable, archivable artifact, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I do end up with text, but still the visual thinking was super important to surface those complexities and break me out of the linear structure that the first draft kind of imposes and then i can also like you say i can snap a picture and, and as you were talking i i remembered i think even microsoft has like a purpose-built app made to snap photos of whiteboards so you oh, yeah. point it at a whiteboard and and it kind of flattens everything and makes it into yep. like a scan and yep. then you can if i really uh, want the visual artifact i can just save it along the markdown save yep. it along the the text i created and then i yep. have both yeah, I use an app called Cam Scanner. And I use that too. It, it's really yeah, good. It's great. And it's got that magic, but you know, that magic function where it does balance the color out. Um, because you know, you're drawing on a white piece of paper, but then when you photograph it, it's you know no longer white. So <laughs> it's that's a that's a pretty sweet app. Um, you know, when I do want to, you know, and I think you know, I love sharing that with folks who are in meetings who are making flip charts, you know, whiteboards with their little bit of shine have their own I'm getting technical but um, yeah it's just a really really useful whether it's a whiteboard or a sketch on a back of a sheet of something printed out or it's a flip chart super easy super easy yeah yeah now another kind of discovery for me in the book all of these when talking visual thinking my natural assumptions there were exactly those things like uh, flip chart, a whiteboard, um, a big sheet of paper, um, yep. and what you call in the book, the landscape. Like I immediately go to this uh, place of the mind map uh, mm -hmm. and like there is this big landscape showing the idea. Yep. And one of the surprising things in the book was you get into index cards and how you can use index cards for visual thinking, which was something that never occurred to me. Could you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I didn't know that my uh, life's work was to introduce people to index cards. Because <laughs> it is the thing that when people take an online course or they read the book, they're like, oh my God, that's my new best friend. Um, it's uh, when I was in sixth grade, we were taught to write a paper using, it happened to be slips of mimeograph paper instead of index cards. And it had a really simple format on it where like, here's the main topic or here's the main idea and da da da. Um, so, I happened to learn that in sixth grade and the heartbreaking thing is I didn't use it. You know, like it, it stuck in my head. I can remember my, my paper was about rabbits and you know, I can picture this one specific car, the common cold in rabbits is called snuffles, you know, it's just like, and I, and it was, it was a really powerful experience that unfortunately wasn't integrated. You know, it was one teacher teaching it for one project. Mm -hmm. And boy, howdy, had I used that through, I mean, I actually happily have strong writing skills, da, 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 but it was, it was, it was unnatural. I would sit in front of a computer screen and think, okay, this is supposed to come out fully formed. I know, you know, knowing that that's not the case, but, yeah. um, but it, I didn't rediscover that until late college. And I think at that point, you know, you talk about the, you know, what you're used to. 
anyway, so I had that experience in sixth grade, and then it re-entered my life, not so much for writing papers, but in, in high school, I had a mentorship with an artist who had, a visual artist who had something called the morgue, and these, this is pre-internet, he literally had file cabinets of folders that were uh, uh, visual references. So if he had to draw a door, here was, you know, a bunch of clippings from magazines or newspapers or, or photos of doors. Like he could pull that if you representational drawing, it was his reference point. And so I got really in, excited about that idea of a morgue less for specific representational images, but for ideas, hmm. because those are always coming. <laughs> so, so, um, so there was just kind of this natural kind of that sixth grade experience and that high school experience uh, so since then, I never, you know, I always have index cards nearby because it's so easy just to to take that idea and get it captured and keep moving. Mm -hmm. And both of my books started with stacks of index cards. And that's my number one advice. It doesn't have to be a book you're writing. That's often, you know, a, a desire a lot of people have, and it feels really impossible. And I just say, look, just start here and collect because they're cheap. And I do say get unlined index cards. If you can't get unlined index cards, flip over lined ones because usually the blank, the, the backside is blank and just get that stuff down. And it can be, you know, hopefully it's legible enough. You can <laughs> read it when you go back to it. But the great thing about an index card is you can put down a piece of text. You can draw a diagram. You can do, you know, it can be anything. And it's just that generative phase of things are coming out and I'm collecting them. And then the beautiful thing about the stack. So the landscape, you're seeing everything at once. The beauty of the landscape is you have to relate things all in one surface. The beauty of the stack is it's modular. So you're able to sort and you can sort with so many different filters. It could be that you're actually sorting to figure out which of these cards go into each chapter. It could be that you're actually sequencing cards and saying, okay, this is really the argument I'm trying to create. And here's point after point after point, which is how we learned to write that, that paper in sixth grade. Um, so it's, and you know, you're gonna sort things out. So that's the lovely thing about a stack is when you're in generative mode, it's just about, you know, you're not judging stuff at that point. There's a whole, you know, models around creative problem solving where um, it's like this diamond shaped model and one side is uh, the, the divergent phase where, you know, you're just, it's the brainstorming phase where you're just coming up with everything. And that, if, that in this process, it's important to, to separate that from the convergent phase where you're being selective, right? right? And the issue is when you mix up those two, you end up, you know, um, judging ideas too quickly, sorting things out too too quickly, and you don't get the kind of like um, the 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 weird outlier ideas and all that kind of stuff. Like editing so, while you're writing versus right. separating those two phases. Exactly, exactly. So the stack just gives you a chance to get the stuff out, and it's just about as and and it's a relief where it's like I got that on an index card, I can keep moving. You know, I don't have to worry about or judging that right now. You know, hopefully, I've certainly come back to <laughs> next cards. I was just doing this a couple of days ago. Where I'm like, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> you know, like, that'll happen too. But, it, you know, happily, it's a fairly low percentage. Um, but that's the beauty of the stack is it can be, you know, and you could have, what I love is um, that you can have a stack of index cards and I could put down three index cards that are about my next online course. You know, another one is like errands I need to do. You know, the next 20 are, you know, for this other project or whatever, like there's, because it's modular, it's okay that your brain is, you know, making all these new associations or coming up with new things or just take, going an entirely different direction. And the modularity, the idea is the, the, old, the, the only thing that's, um, I don't, well, I can say it doesn't feel difficult because I've <laughs> can't ex have experience with it. The, the one part that is tricky about learning how to use a stack is how to split up the idea, so it's one idea per card. And what level of detail do you want it to be? I love, in the book I talk about the anatomy of a card, because I have a certain way, I tend to put the main idea at the top, you know, thicker thicker pen, all caps, like it's just stylistically, there's a consistency card to card that I that's useful to me. And then um, I can use the corners to sort things. Um, so I could say like this, this, I want to get done by this date, or it could be, this is going to cost this much. You know, there's, you can use the, 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 the areas of the card and, uh, create systems for yourself, but that are useful. Um, but I lost it. I lost my train of thought. Stacks are where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 
It, oh, it's oh, it's the, that discipline of deciding what goes, you know, what is the, the proper size amount of, of the information. ADL. Exactly. But that that because when, once you figure that out, and it's not going to be a perfect system, you might put six ideas on a card and then later go, you know what, if I'm going to sort out these ideas, now I just need to write those six ideas each on their own card. So, you know, it's a very forgiving adaptive medium and process. Um, but that there's that once you can clue into this is a distinct idea from this idea, that's when you can push things around and sort things out or sequence and and figure out okay what is it that I'm working here and then you know if it's a if it's a book or if it's a paper or if it's a speech great now you have this beautiful <laughs> you know outline for yourself um, what I love with speaking is um, if I'm giving my keynote like I could have a stack of cards or I'm doing a workshop I'll have a stack of cards of these are the things I want to teach and you know I might go into um, you know thinking I'm going to be doing 45 minutes and if somebody says well somebody went long you have 30, you know, I'm thinking in those kind of pieces so I could actually just go, okay, since I have, I have a very, it's not one whole 45 minute thing. It really is these pieces. There's a, a lovely adaptability to that kind of thinking where you go, okay, you know what? I'm just going to take these two out. It's okay. Even if I'm not at that point, physically holding cards, like somebody you have, it, you have the model in your mind. Exactly. Exactly. That's amazing. You know, that that's for me, that's a new realization, even though I went over it in the book. Um, yeah the immense power of index cards, because when I look at, again, at a text editor, or when I look at even a visual landscape, very naturally one idea um, sits in relation to others at yeah. the beginning, in the middle, on the corner, whatever. Yep. And for that initial phase of getting something out, often I find myself, especially when there's a measure of turmoil or confusion or just a lot going on, maybe excitement doesn't have to be any good thing. I, and, and I, before I output my ideas into some tangible form, they're running around in circles in my mind. I yeah. find myself thinking the same thoughts again and again and again. It's not always clear what is more important than the other. And by using the stack, I can just kind of like, okay, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. And I focus on kind of the atoms almost, like capturing yep. the little pieces. And then, okay, now they're all out. Now, now I can arrange them. Yep, exactly. That's and even in a document, you're still, you're still, you know, you may, if you want to retrieve an idea or see how something relates, there's a lot of scrolling, you know, oh, yeah. you can't see the entire thing at once. Now, what I love about cards is uh, in the book, you can explicitly see where I took that stack and I used a pin board to physically push them around until I figured out, okay, these are the five steps. This is the, these are the concepts I want to be in these steps. And, you know, that pin board, you know, there was still iteration and refinement past that. But you can do that where you can you can make it a landscape for you know however much time you need it to be a landscape and then i love the fact that you can just say i'm only focusing on this one card <laughs> like all these post-it notes stuck to cards so like you know i can you know i'm only going to focus on this thing right now right mm -hmm. so that's the the beauty of it is is it's so malleable in what you can do with them so hopefully we've converted everybody to index cards who's watching this. <laughs> That's amazing. So yeah, so actually we went over a lot, right? At iteration and the landscape and physical versus iPad and like yeah. a ton of stuff. So if someone's watching this now and is intrigued or want to try out the, the power of visual thinking, is there something anyone can do in like five, 10 minutes with whatever they have to hand to experience some of what visual thinking has to offer? I think the stack is a perfect place to start. You know, you don't have to have official index cards. You could take, you know, printouts, you know, scrap paper, fold them into pieces. I think consistently size pieces is useful. Um, but again, just, just that practice of, okay, I'm trying to get all these ideas out and I'm kind of trying to get them one per piece of paper. A lot of people have post notes around, you can do the same thing. And again, that's probably for a lot of people, they're not gonna think that's visual but it's kinesthetic and it's spatial and you can write text on one card and you can make a sketch of something on another card. Um, so I think that is like, you know, it's kind of the, the, something you could do after finishing watching this and just see what happens, what do you get from it? And hopefully for those who are trying that notice, you know, what, what does it feel like? You know, is it a relief? Is, does it feel tense? You know, does it feel uncomfortable because it's new? 
So then the key would be I would grab a bunch of index cards and a series of ideas or some thoughts I have and try yep. to get them one thought per card, essentially. Yep. yep. And should I try to make pictures? Is it okay to use words for that initial oh, yeah. exercise? That's the biggest thing is, is when people are introduced to the concept of visual thinking, so many, because, again, because we've been trained in tech so beautifully and <laughs> trained away from imagery, even though we're around, we're surrounded by images, right? Yeah. So we, each one of us are actually really sophisticated as viewers. Like we've been very well trained all around the world to recognize what different images mean, you know, completely outside of sort of like being an art history major, right? Um, so we're actually really sophisticated as viewers. The gap is, you know, what skills we have as a maker. So just recognize that there's still a whole lot going for you. What happens so often is when somebody gets excited about visual thinking, the next thought is, oh, images are good, words are bad. So then they don't want to do, you know, they're like, I don't know, I have words, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, convey this thought in an icon. What ha then happens is they get, they take most of their mental energy and get it tied up into this translation. And it's a very binary thinking of, well, you know, I want to, it's something about a rabbit. So now I have to draw a rabbit. And then the next idea is this is about a giraffe. Oh, I don't know how to draw a giraffe. Or this new idea is about, uh, evolution and they're like what do I do for evolution because <laughs> it's a more you know abstract concept <clears throat> so that's just to say that that words and images work together and like you saw in that super sketchy diagram it can be shapes it can be you know you can draw a box and label it house and that's perfectly mm -hmm. effective so um you know I I just generally you know the inner critic I like to talk about the it's a, the day I kind of like this clicked in my own mind was like oh my gosh the inner, like drawing is the enemy of the inner critic. Because that inner critic is telling you that you can't do this and it's a stupid idea and da 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 And when you, you know, shush that inner critic and push him aside, him, her, they aside, whatever that shows up for you as, and you just get that idea out, now it's tangible. Right. And it may be messy and it may not be fully formed, but now it exists <laughs> outside of your head, away from that inner critic. And so it's like, the inner critic killer. So, and I know that's, you know, I can, I can say that and, and laugh about it, but it, it is true. And it takes a lot of practice to get better and better and better at just saying, you know what, I'm just getting this down. I'm just getting this down. I can always iterate. I can always work with this later. Totally fine. Um, but that's, you know, th those are the kind of things you can get when you just kind of like say, you know what, I'm going to try this. Like you said, you had so many great stories where you're like, I'm going to try this. And it felt a little weird and then it felt good. And then this part felt weird and then this felt good. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. You know, that is part of the process. Amazing. Super, super cool. I love how, I love how easy it is to get started once you like how physically easy it is to get started. Like yeah. no gear, you don't need anything special. You can just go for it and that's super cool. That that in itself is power, right? Yeah. Like just being able to just go and do it anywhere in the world with pretty much any tools you have. And yeah, for sure. Yep. And then if people um, watching or listening to this want to dig deeper, uh, would this would this be a good starting point? I would say that if if you're still watching and you're like, I don't know about this, um, I would recommend. Uh, so my site is loosetooth.com. Mm -hmm. Doesn't describe what I do, but it's memorable. Great um, and <laughs> and uh, I highly recommend. There's a there is a video about uh, killing the inner critic. So more about that. What I just described. Um, that's a great introductory video. So if you go to the site, there's a link that says why visual thinking matters. You'll definitely see that there. There's also just a very overview. Um, what is visual thinking? If you look up what is visual thinking on YouTube, you're going to find it right away. Um, that's also a good. Uh, introduction to that that bouncing between abstraction and and making something concrete and also like like i just described um thinking about visual thinking uh that it's it's words and images and it's not icons it's so much more um and then you know i like i said i did a tedx talk and that's called shape your thinking so i think those are three pieces of of video that can hopefully make the case for you if you're if you're still like mm, not sure about this uh the idea shapers i adore i'm very proud of it it was it was extremely hard to create but i'm very proud of the results and it's really dense and i you know you may i i think you're you're i, I think why we connected so quickly 
um, on our last conversation was, you know, the, the love of thinking, the love of processing, the love of learning. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's a dense book. <laughs> so, so I think uh, generally I, I recommend that if you're reading it, just notice what resonates with you and focus on that. Hmm. You know, there's, it's, it really is a pattern language of visual thinking. That was my intent going into it. So, you know, you may find something where like iteration might be something that for one person is like, I don't, I don't really understand that. Fine. Great. But you find this other thing and you're like, wow, that makes perfect sense. So just, you know, I want to let folks know that there's a whole lot in there. It, for me, it does feel like the universe of visual thinking. That was its intention, but just dip into it and say, you know, notice what, what resonates. Practice. Practice is going to be, you know, 10 times, 100 times more important than reading the book because that's when it's really going to make sense. Like, you know, your stories illustrate. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think it's one of those books to to come back to and every time. And I like how it's organized around the specific tools because then it, it's almost like a dictionary. If I'm trying to express yep. myself and I'm already using visual thinking, but I think I could be doing it better. It's something I can't, you know, I can always kind of leaf through it. And this yep. is actually one of the reasons why I got the physical book. I'm, I'm a big Kindle guy. I, I love the Kindle. Most of my reading is, is eBooks. Yeah. This particular one, I wanted to have the paper version because it is such a physical process. And I, I like to have it to hand when I'm sketching stuff. And then I'm like, hmm, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe there is something I could learn here. Or what was it about? Um, sizes. Oh, I can I can quickly flip to that and refer to it with yep. pen in hand, you know, and, and, yeah. my, and my sketch right there. So. And the, the the dirty secret is there is a Kindle book of my a Kindle version of my first book. I still haven't gotten around to do the Kindle version of that one. And really? strangely, you know, I've only had a handful of people ask for it because I think that's how people do relate to it. Um, and I think that's, you know, that physicality of flipping and just going, okay, got it. And then you're immediately just turning to, you know, that index card or that piece of paper. So there yeah. will be a Kindle version. There just isn't <laughs> at the moment of us recording this. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much. This has Absolutely. been a really, really interesting conversation. Yeah, total pleasure. I love, I, I love any any opportunity to share these ideas, but to have such a rich conversation, and of course, to hear how you know. I don't think you knew about my work. Uh, what a couple weeks ago? <laughs> yeah, and how new to me? Like I'm told. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And so you're already using these, and you know, already using some of these techniques, and already seeing results from it. So that is. You're, you're, you know, you're going to have to evangelize with me alongside me now. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandy. Yeah, total pleasure. Thank you.